G'day everyone, welcome back to the channel. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about gluteal tendonitis or gluteal tendinopathy, depending on who you are. So one of the things I think that's really important to get to in this video is towards the end of the video, we're gonna talk about two, maybe three exercises that I find work really, really well uh, to help you get on top of those symptoms, that hip pain that you tend to have. But before we get to those exercises, I wanna have a, a brief chat about something that I think is really important to cover to put those exercises into context but also because I think, um, you know, having been a physical therapist now for the best part of 15 years, there's an aspect to this type of dysfunction that I think we're missing. And I think it's really important to shine a light on this so that those of you who have hip bursitis or some gluteal tendonitis, which tend to go hand in hand a lot of the times, but I think if you've got those symptoms, if you've got that lateral hip pain at the side of the hip, it's really important you consider this one piece of information because it does tie into a lot of the reasons for why you might be having the symptoms that you have. And it can also help explain why it may be on one side and not the other, or why it might be both sides or at least worse on one side, which I think we don't necessarily do a fantastic job of explaining in the industry. But hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a really clear understanding about what might be the baseline or the underlying root cause of that gluteal tendonitis. And then the two or three exercises that we'll go through at the end will hopefully feed into addressing some of the symptoms that you may have, but also trying to address the root cause of why those symptoms are there. And from what I find clinically, I'm hoping that it might be part of the missing piece of the puzzle of your rehab. If you come to this video and you're struggling to shake that tendonitis, hopefully this is that, that final piece of information that you've been missing. Uh, you can put it into place and then hopefully the results will speak for themselves. So, so before we get into it, uh, if you do go on to enjoy the video, uh, please support the channel by leaving a like below and consider subscribing to the channel if you are new. Um, it's obviously a great way to keep in touch with all this information that we're putting out as it comes out. Um, and then what I'd also like you guys to do is in the comments below, let me know how you're going with your gluteal tendonitis. You know, how long have you had it for? What have you tried that you felt has worked really well? What have you tried that hasn't worked really well? You know, where are you at in your recovery process? Are you someone who's just looking for a little bit of extra information to sort of top up what you're already doing? Um, are you someone who's just struggling to shake it in any form uh, and just looking for some you know, different perspective or some different information? Or are you someone who's been bounced around a whole bunch of different physical therapists? Are you someone who's had a bunch of treatments or injections? You've seen all the doctors, you've considered surgery and all this sort of stuff, and you're just looking for um, something different or a solution that you didn't know. Um, let me know down below because I want to sort of learn sort of what brings you to these videos so I can make the content more specific and more beneficial to you going forward. So, um, so if you could do that, that'd be fantastic. So the first thing that I want to talk about in terms of gluteal tendonitis or gluteal tendinopathy is potentially this hidden cause that I referenced before. And I guess without leaving you guys in suspense, the... From what I find clinically, gluteal tendonitis and gluteal tendinopathy is potentially a back-related condition, um, which may sound strange for a lot of people because a lot of people can just have a painful hip and that's it. And as soon as you mention that maybe the back's the cause or one of the causes of that dysfunction, it's hard for them to reconcile that information if they don't also have a sore back as well. Some people do have some hip bursitis or some gluteal tendonitis and a sore back. So for you guys, it's probably not too big of a leap of faith to take here. But for everyone else who has the hip pain but doesn't have the back pain, the thing that I want you to sort of take from this video, one of the things to take from this video, is that you don't have to have a sore back, but you do have to have or potentially have to have some back dysfunction. And what I mean by that is we're talking joint stiffness or muscular tightness in a very specific area of the back. And what I want to basically show you guys, what I want to get across today, is we're generally not necessarily talking about the lower back, which seems to be the area that everyone focuses on when we talk about back dysfunction. I'm actually talking about the base of the rib cage and a little bit above and a little bit below. So that T12 L1 section, um, but for anyone who's not aware of the levels, just the base of the rib cage, where the rib cage ends and inserts into the lower back, um, that section seems to have a lot of neural connections, uh, muscular connections, um, you know, general connections to that hip and the hip musculature. And what I'm finding clinically is if, if you're someone who slouches a lot, maybe you're in a position where you're always kicking your hinge into your back, particularly through that section of the back that we're gonna work on, then what can happen is over time, the areas that connect to that specific part of your back can start to become dysfunctional. They can weaken, uh, they can become tight, and eventually can become dysfunctional 
if you then need to use those sort of altered tissues. Now, I'll leave a link up here. We've done videos before on um, how important the back is for people who have weak glutes and how weak glutes probably aren't um, weak muscles, but more deactivated muscles from a dysfunctional lower back. So in terms of getting that strength back, you don't just have to pound the, the glute exercises, the hip strength exercises to get, your, uh, to get yourself stronger. What you can do is you can free up that back, improve your spinal function, and that strength comes back most of the time on its own. Some people need to do some strength work as well to supplement maybe being sort of weak for a long time. But the root cause of that is potentially the same section of the lower back that we're talking about in this video that, that sort of uh, seems to set those gluteal tendons up to become dysfunctional over time. So I think it's really important to make that connection that there are these really baseline sort of fetal connections between <clears throat> that section of your spine and your hip muscles. So if you are someone who doesn't have a gluteal tendonitis or a gluteal tendinopathy, but you have weak glutes, you have tight glutes, you just always have this awareness of some glute dysfunction. The exercises that we'll go through in a second are still for you guys, because even if you're not talking about pain, we still value dysfunction. Anything that's not normal, anything that doesn't function normally can either set you up for dysfunction and pain down the line, or if you're an athlete who values performance, or you're just a person who values being normal and feeling normal, we need to make sure we're going after those hidden dysfunctions so we can sort of open the door for things to get better. So, so the first point I wanted to make in the video is that if you have any gluteal tendonitis and gluteal tendinopathy and you're not focusing on improving the function of your back, then potentially you're missing the biggest piece of the puzzle that has caused that dysfunction or at least set that area up to become dysfunctional at some stage. And obviously if you're doing glute strength exercises, you're getting a massage, you're having physical therapy, you're doing all the things that you're being told to do, maybe getting injections and all that sort of stuff, and you're not also having a conversation with your lower back, then again, you're not potentially giving your, your, your hips a chance to, you're not providing an environment for those hips to get better permanently, which is ultimately what we want for you guys. So, so what we want to do in terms of the exercises that we'll go through, they're two really simple exercises to begin with. All you need is a foam roller or a tennis ball slash lacrosse ball, which is a lacrosse ball here. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go straight for that lower back dysfunction. And this exercise isn't fancy at all. It's a very basic exercise, but there's some very specific things you need to think about in order to make it the most effective for you guys going forwards. So what we want to get you to do, so ideally you'll do this on the floor. Um, if you've got a foam roller, if this is too big, then maybe a half foam roller is better for you. If the carpet's too strong, then obviously you can do this on the bed. If it's too easy for you, you can do this on a hardwood floor. You just want to find an environment that you feel is giving you the right amount of pressure and making an effective change to your symptoms. So, so what we want to basically do is, again, we want to target this sort of, not the middle of your back, but sort of just below that where the base of that rib cage is. And obviously we want to get the foam roller onto that section. <clears throat> and what I'll get you guys to do is, the common misconception with foam roller exercises is that you have to roll up and down on them. Now you can do that uh, on your legs and on your arms if you're trying to sort of mobilize some soft tissue. But we're actually going after the joints of your spine with this exercise. And the, the segments of your spine are very, very specific. You can see that. So, um, so we don't want to roll over the top of those joints. We want to get some constant pressure on each level for a period of time to get those rusty joints to eventually start to give and slide and normalize again so that the area becomes more functional and then the dysfunction that's perpetuated down to those hips has a chance to get better. So, so what I want you guys to do is you can roll to begin with, but only until you find the part of your back that feels a little bit stiff and tight. Obviously you can have a towel behind you, or a pillow, sorry. But for the purposes of this video, we'll just go straight onto the floor. So for me, I'm gonna lift up, uh, lift up my, my bottom and finding a spot here that feels a little bit stiff for me and I can drop my hips down to the ground if you feel flexible enough otherwise you can have a pillow here or a pillow here uh, just to put you in a better position but what we want you to do here is clinically one side will feel a bit stiffer and tighter than the other so for me if I just gently roll my body towards the left hand side here it feels a little bit stiff a little bit tight I'm fortunate that it doesn't hurt I come across to the other side, it doesn't feel anywhere near as restricted as the left side for me. So for me, I want to find this, the, the level of my back that feels you know, pretty stiff and tight, and then also the side that feels a little bit stiff and tight, and I'm just going to stay here. Now, 
One of the things that I want to make sure that you guys are comfortable with is if you have some hip dysfunction, this may feel quite threatening and quite challenging to do. So again, if you've got a pillow or something to keep you more, uh, more even, just so you're not putting as much pressure through here, please do. But imagine I've got a pillow here. What I want to do is I want to take some comfortable deep breaths. So if this is quite intense for you. Take a deep breath in and then sigh on the way out. Really give your body a chance to relax through this. Remember, if you feel really tense and you're holding on, you're probably going a little bit too far into the stretch. But more importantly, if you're holding on and you're holding your breath, you're not cueing your body into giving and relaxing and becoming looser over time. So, so we want to make sure that you find a stiff spot and just hang out here. Take some deep breaths in and out until you feel like this area begins to mobilize and become softer and more tolerable. And then it's up to you guys just to move a little bit lower or a little bit higher, just looking for those segments of your spine that are dysfunctional. So remember, you don't have to have overt back pain. You don't have to be walking around noticing that your back hurts. But inevitably, as soon as you jump on a roller or a rolled up tail or whatever you've got lying around, you should be able to start to find some segments of your spine in that sort of base of that ribcage area, a little bit below, a little bit above, that aren't normal. So if you can pick on the side that feels like it's stiffer, that it doesn't sink in as easy, even if there's some tenderness, prioritize the side that feels the most restrictive because that's most likely the root cause that sort of, of all those consequences that filter down uh, that create that hip dysfunction. So, um, so spend some time doing that to the point where you should automatically feel like your back is freer and looser than what it was to begin with immediately afterwards. You shouldn't feel like you've just beaten yourself up just make sure that you're edging into that stretch in a way that feels comfortable so that you're not, you know, you're not doing anything that your body feels threatened with long term. Now, if you feel like the foam roller is a little bit too intense for you, you can do the exact same thing with a ball. Just make sure that you're choosing a ball that feels like it gives you enough pressure on a surface that you feel gets in enough for you. Um, same concept as with a foam roller. Um, but again, we don't want to roll around on it. We want to move around until we find a stiff spot and then stay there breathe through it until it starts to give and then continue the quest to find the next piece of stiffness and tightness and then automatically feeling freer afterwards. Exercise number one. Exercise number two is a little bit more specific to the hip itself. Now, uh, one of the things I think is really important to understand with this is clearly the, there's going to be some local pain and tenderness at that hip. So as those gluteal muscles attach and insert via the tendon into the hip bone, there's potentially going to be some tenderness, some soreness, uh, some pain there. Um, so we need to respect that. The interesting thing with the ball is that I don't want you to put the ball on the area that genuinely uh, causes you your pain. If there's an irritated, annoyed section of that hip, you're not going to make it feel amazing potentially by jamming something into it. But what you can do is everything around that is fair game. So if the tendon itself, the gluteal tendon, which has become dysfunctional, is sore, there's nothing stopping you getting into the muscle itself before it turns into the tendon. And there's every, there's every chance that that gluteal muscle has become tight and thickened and, and tender on its own, but because it's not the source of your pain, or it's not the pain that you're experiencing, you can be a little bit more sort of adventurous with that area while still being respectful to how it feels. What we want to do basically is again use a tennis ball if this is quite tender but we just want to put the ball on the ground it's nothing fancy and we want to we want to ease into it so we want to move the ball around until you feel you hit something that is tender and tight but isn't your tender uh, sorry isn't your tendon pain anything around that so more in towards the sort of the back pocket of the hip and a little bit around is and you'll find it very easily and what I want to get you to do here is we can go through this in two different ways. So try these out and see which works best for you. The first one we can do is wherever you are on, the muscles that you're digging into, give those muscles a squeeze for five seconds, tense them up. This gets your brain involved. And what happens is as soon as you release that, you should feel like the ball sort of sinks in a little bit further than before. It allows your tissue to relax. And it, it gives your body some more confidence that everything's okay. So again, I've got a tight spot here, a little bit tender. I want to tense that spot up, hold it for about five to 10 seconds. And then when I relax, it doesn't feel as tender anymore. And over time, this will help free it up faster. So again, just work your way through each little part of the body. Again, don't just roll it around. Um, it, it may make you feel tender, 
But if you find a spot, give it a squeeze, then relax, the ball sinks in further. Give it a squeeze for five seconds, relax, the ball sinks in further. It's a great way to restore some normal function to those muscles around those tendons that are sore. Second part of this exercise is when you've found a good tender spot, what we can do is we can use movement of the actual hip to, uh, to sort of decrease some of the adhesions, to free up some of that soft tissue and get that fascia sliding a little bit better underneath. So I don't know if you better see this very well, uh, but I'm on that same spot. And what, what I want to do with my leg here is I want to internally rotate that leg. And as I'm internally rotating that, I'm shearing free some of the tissue in between the ball and my hip. Now, again, you might see this a little bit more if I use, if I bend my knee here, but we're just trying to find some tight spots, some tender spots, and use movement to restore as much normal motion to those tissues as possible. So again, that's a really tender spot for me. I need to make sure that I breathe. I'm not holding my breath. Um, I need to make sure that this doesn't feel too threatening for my body in order to make this go away quickly. Again, if you have a really flared up gluteal tendonitis or tendinopathy, you need to be very gentle and respectful with the ball because it might just be really tender. But as you start to sort of chip away at some of that tenderness, you can get underneath that a little bit more, you can start to make a hell of a lot of change to, the, to how that sort of tissue feels. So I'd always advise going after the lower back stuff first because if a lot of that dysfunction starts from your back and works its way down, then by freeing up that back, you might find you take away some of that dysfunction before you even get to it with the ball. It might make it feel a little bit less tender to begin with. And the other thing that we might see on top of all this is you can actually get some referred type symptoms from your back in terms of pain. So I guess the idea that I want to promote with this video is if your lower back is stiff, tight, and dysfunctional, mechanically, it can set off a chain reaction of events that set that glute up to fail when it does. But on top of that, it can also refer some pain or increase some pain if there is dysfunction there. So going after the back dysfunction can be a really simple, relatively stress-free, pain-free way to sort of take away some of those symptoms, upregulate that function and give you sort of a kickstart to your recovery. So, so those two exercises are the ones that I sort of give to anyone that comes in with a gluteal tendonitis or a tendinopathy. Hip bursitis, it's the same conversation. They're often, as I said at the start, they often go hand in hand. So hopefully those two exercises are easy for you guys to do. If, if you're very sore and very tender, try and find the best version of those stretches for you guys just to start that ball rolling um, and allow, the, you know, allow your symptoms to snowball at some point. So, um, so I said there's two or three exercises. That was two. The third one is kind of an exercise or a pseudo exercise in a sense, but it's more so just an awareness. Now, the, the most important thing is that if we know that maybe sitting habits aren't great and it causes the back to hinge and stiffen and become dysfunctional over time, if you're you know, on the computer or just relaxing back into the couch or sitting up in bed to read, whatever it is, if you continue to put your back in a less than perfect position as opposed to a, a more mechanically sound position, it's very hard for any of these exercises or any of the things that you might already be doing to have any immediate impact or lasting impact if you're consistently putting it in a bad shape. So exercise number three, if you can call it an exercise, is I want you guys, once you finish watching this video, is to have a think about how you position your back during the moments that you sit throughout the day, whether it's when you drive, when you sit on the couch, sit at the computer, sit up in bed to read, sit on the toilet, whatever it might be. If you spend any time slouching or sinking through your back and staying there, then you need to ask yourself whether you can change that. And if you can, it's really important you consider changing it or throwing a pillow or a rolled up towel in there to stop yourself from dropping down so that these symptoms can go away. So I hope that was really useful information. As I said, if you did find it useful, let me know in the comments below. Let me know where you're at so we can sort of make these videos more um, so we can tailor these videos to suit your needs uh, more than we already are, hopefully. Um, please consider leaving a like and subscribing just to support the channel. Um, there's a lot of really cool information that isn't really out there, but clinically is really sort of promising and, and foundationally sort of shifting the way that at least I'm thinking about how to treat someone. Um, so if you'd love to be a part of that, please do. Um, but with that being said, thanks for joining us. Um, I hope that was helpful. Let me know if it was, and I'll see you next time.